So, um, obviously, before I start, I want to thank you all for coming, because you might be asleep by the end. So I might as well get that over with. Um, I could have said that it was brave of you to um, get out and pass through Storm Gareth, but that was yesterday, so that doesn't work either. And anyway. Okay, so I was, um, when I was asked to come, I was given this title, and I thought, I wonder what that could all be all about. And then I thought, I'll keep it, see what happens. And so that's where we are tonight. I've kept the title, and now I'm going to try to fit the talk into whatever the title says. So it is true that I will be speaking about um, my research in relativistic fluid dynamics, but I'm uh, acutely conscious of the fact that some of you are probably not at the point yet in your life where you've done a lot of relativity. Okay? So rather than flashing some um, equations and trying to just show some complicated uh, things, which would be pointless, I think, uh, what I've tried to do is I've tried to um, set things up so that, yes, there's going to be some details, not many, but there's going to be some details that uh, you might not have seen before. But the way I'm going to do it, right, the, way I, the way I wanted to approach this is as uh, pictures. Okay? I wanted to approach the kind of mathematics, if there is something you haven't seen, just as pictures, let it, you know, flow over you, and then we see where we are at the end. So what I'm trying, what I'm going to try to do, is to give you an idea of how people that work on this, on these kinds of problems, how they think about them. Okay? What is important and what is not. And then I want to try to give you an idea of what some of the things that those of us that worry about these things um, that we worry about. And then I would also like to talk about some of the things that I think we should worry about. And these are things that haven't really changed for you know, quite a long time. Um, and so I'm going to try to explain to you why that is and where we kind of are. So that's my plan, as it is. Okay. Uh, and so, basically, I've got uh, three jobs to do, I think. I'm going to try to explain the words in the title. The word relativistic, the word fluid, and the word flows. Now, you might think you know all this, so then you can just sit back and fall asleep. That's fine, I don't really care. But let's start from the very beginning. So, fluid dynamics is uh, a very old subject, obviously. Um, but, and you're taught, probably taught fluid dynamics in different guises throughout an undergraduate degree at many proper universities. Um, we don't really teach fluid dynamics anymore. For various reasons. But when you're taught fluid dynamics, it's often the case that the way you're taught fluid dynamics is totally off track from what is actually going on when people do research in fluid dynamics. You're taught neat little mathematical tricks, how to use complex variables or something like that to solve some problems that no one really ever cared about. Because you can. And that seems to be the only motivation for doing it. Whereas fluid dynamics as, a, as a, a live sort of subject is something completely different. It's an area where we, basically all of physics meets. Okay? So that's what I want to try to tell you about. And so there are two different ways of thinking about fluids. There might be more, but the essence is that fluid dynamics is a collective phrase to describe something. Say, well, I know there is a problem I would like to solve. But it's too hard for me. So I'm going to simplify the problem to the point where I can deal with it. So I'm going to write down a theory that I'm going to call fluid dynamics. And it's based on simplifications that makes the problem manageable. Okay? So what do I mean by that? For example, I'd like to know how the oceans work. I want to know about ocean currents, tides, and so on. But I recognize that I can't track every single atom 
a molecule of water in the ocean. That's far beyond me. There's no computer that could ever do that. It's also it's pointless. Okay? So instead, I think of some average over particles in a box, say. I'm going to call those boxes fluid elements. And then I just look at how those boxes move on average. So I don't care about individual particles. I just care about these average quantities. So, the problem here is, it's not obvious, two things are not obvious. First of all, how big should I take these boxes to be? I don't really know. They have to be big enough that I have enough particles in them, say, some number, um, big N over there. It has to be big enough that I can actually meaningfully average over this box. But they have to be small enough that I don't start saying, oh, this box is bigger than the system. That would be pointless. Um, and sometimes, when you start looking at what happens, what comes out of the model that you built, it turns out that you end up in trouble because you've chosen the wrong sort of scales here. So the typical scales you would think about is something like, you know, the particles, the molecules bumping into each other, they collide and so on. I don't want to bother with that. I want to have some effective phenomenological description that just says, it's a bit like this described in as small numbers of parameters as I can get. That's what I'd like. So that's one way of thinking about fluid dynamics, something where you start from the very small and you ask, okay, so when I average, what happens? What can I get away with? And then there's a completely different way of thinking about it, although they are related, which comes from, in a way, from quantum physics, where you try to describe the world in terms of field theories, or quantum field theories, where it's common to talk about a fluid dynamics limit, where you think of fluctuations, say quantum fluctuations, and if you take the very long wavelength fluctuations, you're back in this situation where you're averaging to small numbers of parameters. And so what you'll find, especially in the context of relativistic fluids, you find both of these traditions. I belong to the first, the one where you worry about what the particles do, average over that, and write down fluid dynamics in a very classical kind of sense. But I have colleagues that work on, say, black hole physics and string theory inspired gravity that come from exactly the opposite direction, from the field theory direction. And we can spend hours and hours talking to each other at cross purposes because you use the same words to mean slightly different things. And this is a very important example, I think, of how the language you use to communicate in science is incredibly important. It's important not to use the same word to mean different things, yet we do that pretty regularly. Okay? So that's what I'm talking about. Um, another way to describe it is that when I do this averaging, I look at, at the small number of parameters. Essentially what I'm doing is I'm talking about thermodynamics. And so I thought I'd share with you the wisdom of um, no lesser thinker than Wikipedia on what thermodynamics is. You know all truth really comes from Wikipedia, and so why not? So basically, thermodynamics deals with heat and temperature and so on. The key point is that we are interested in macroscopic variables. We want to make some average statement about the system, governed by some laws. Now, I'm not going to be talking much about these, but underlying absolutely everything that I'm saying are thermodynamic laws and principles. And sitting here, the you know, relations that relate these variables, like in a fluid, pressure and energy and densities and so on, um, that all pretty much collectively tend to be referred to as Gibbs relations. So I thought the picture of Gibbs would be appropriate. Um, I'm not going to talk much about it because it gets quickly, it gets quite hairy. Okay, so I'm going to skip all of that. But it's all sort of sitting underneath, bubbling underneath. Instead, I want to focus on um, the how and what about relativistic fluids. Okay? That's my focus. I'm not going to talk about the thermodynamics, even though it's incredibly important. I'm going to talk about the relativity part. So, relativity and fluid dynamics are fairly uncomfortable partners 
in a way. And that's what I want to leave you at the end. Okay? Um, they're uncomfortable partners because relativity enters into this picture in different ways. For example, in this little box, the particles move around. Right? If they move at very high velocities individually, I need to worry about the fact that the velocities could be high compared to the speed of light. So if I'm at very high pressures, particles move very fast, I need to worry about relativity in the special relativity sense. Right? Then I can take the box and say, well, this box moves really fast. So collectively, they move maybe slowly, but the box moves with its along at a tremendous speed. I need to worry about special relativity on that scale. Right? And then it gets a little bit worse because I also have to worry about gravity. So the point where the curvature of space and time, so in Einstein's general relativity, impacts on the fluid dynamics. Okay? And so these are three very different ways that relativity enters. I'm going to worry about the, them the varying degrees, but maybe not spare that so much. Okay? So I'm going to talk about the larger scales, the average scale, and my focus is, in a sense, on how we go about understanding complex fluid flows, i will try to tell you what I mean by that, in the context of general relativity, with a curved space-time. Okay? I'm not going to talk about the small scale physics, the thermodynamics and so on, because it would be way, way too much. But I want to hint at some of the points where things like heat comes in and really messes up the story. Okay? So that's my plan. So why would I bother? Why do people keep on doing this? So there are two very simple answers. One is the Large Hadron Collider and other uh, collider experiments, which try to explore the extremes of physics by banging particles together. And so what you do is you create um, matter at fairly low densities, because, you know, crash things there, they still have fairly low densities, but they have enormous temperatures. So if you think of this in terms of a phase diagram where you have some density temperature, then you're looking somewhere in the, where it says quarks and gluons rather than round circle kind of thing there. You crash things together, and what happens is you crash the things together and they form a thing that for a brief time behaves like a fluid. So you can describe this remnant after the collision. It doesn't last for very long, but you can describe it, describe it in terms of fluid dynamics. Okay? It's highly relativistic because you crash things together at high speeds. Okay? And then you can ask, okay, there's, uh, there's another completely different area, which is where I'm coming from, which is the astrophysics side of things, where the remnants of stars can form three things. Black holes are kind of cool, but don't have much to do with fluids until the very end of the talk. Um, white dwarfs are kind of boring, because they're like just dead stars. And then in the middle, you've got neutron stars, which weigh a little bit more than the sun, crammed into something like 10 kilometers, meaning you're reaching densities that are vastly above when the nuclei start touching. You just compress things, so you're beyond what we call the nuclear saturation density. And that means that they are fluid bodies, but this is the kind of fluids that everything is cranked up to a very high rate, maybe 11. So this is where I'm coming from, uh, trying to understand through theory and astrophysics observations what goes on inside the neutral star? So I'm not going to talk about the neutral star particularly. There will be some a movie, but nothing in detail because it's messy. But I can tell you why I think this is just the best physics problem ever. Okay? It's the best physics problem ever because you're allowed to use everything you didn't learn as an undergraduate student. Okay? You have to worry about gravity, because if there's no gravity, there's no star. Okay? So you need, because it's a very compact star, you need to worry about general relativity. So you can use the word Einstein in talks, and that's always good. Right? That makes people excited, and you get loads of exciting letters from friends that want to tell you why Einstein was wrong. You need electromagnetism, because otherwise, 
um, you wouldn't see neutral stars in a different, some of the manifestations like radio pulsars, uh, magnetars that we see in X-rays, we see neutral stars in gamma rays. You need to figure out how they emit this radiation and it's through their magnetic field. So you need electromagnetic magnetism in general relativity. So that's an interesting combination. You need the strong interaction from particle physics because that's what determines what the star is made of. How many protons and electrons per neutron? Are there other states of matter? Are there something called hydrons? Are there deconfined quarks? What's the thing made of? It depends on the strong interaction. And then you need the weak interaction, loosely speaking, the interaction that involves neutrinos, because that's the part that dictates what is the viscosity inside this star, how does it evolve, how does it age, and that couples into how does the magnetic field evolve. This is an immensely complicated object that basically takes all the physics we know, puts it in a bucket, and stirs around, and something comes out. Now, there is no one on this planet that can deal with this. Okay? All of it. No one. Some of us are trying to deal with some of this. A modest little corner. But the problem is such, it's just a fantastic problem. Okay? So the context is Einstein's general theory of relativity. And so I thought I should just write down the Einstein field equations because that's, that's always a good place to start. Uh, and then I realized that it's probably not such a good idea. But the essence is, Einstein's theory is the theory of geometry. The theory that says you put some matter in, it's encoded in the thing on the right of this equation, the T alpha beta is called the stress energy momentum tensor, or energy momentum stress, those three words in some random order, because there are some permutations. Uh, and that basically says, this is all the stuff. Okay? And then on the other side, you've got this G alpha beta, um, that is an expression of the geometry of space and time. So the equation says the matter on the right tells the geometry what shape it should have, what, what the geometry tells space what the geometry should be, and the geometry in turn tells the matter how to move. So it's a very beautiful kind of balance, right? Um, and those equations might look simple. There's an 8 in there. We know what that is. Pi. There's, you might know some decimal places of pi. And big G is Newton's gravitational constant. C is the speed of light. Easy. All of it. T is matter. Um, so we need to understand this matter, say, of the neutral stars, to put something in there. It's not clear what that should be. And then we need to solve these equations, and they're a little bit complicated because the alphas and betas are space-time indices, so they take four values. So there's essentially 16 equations on the board. There is 16 equations that if you write them down in some arbitrary choice of coordinates, they can have thousands of terms in them, and they're highly nonlinear partial differential equations. Nobody wants to deal with this. Nobody. Okay. So it's a very complicated problem. So to do this for realistic settings is, is hard. Okay? But the name of the game is, you put something in on the right, a model for a star or something, and then you solve for the geometry which is expressed in something called the space-time metric. And that space-time metric is the ultimate goal. Okay? But the problem is that matter, space and time are flexible. So they have dynamics. Okay? And that's where it gets fun, and that's where it gets complicated. Now, these equations have different symmetries, and one important symmetry of the equations is that if you take the divergence, just think of this as an object, like a vector object, or it's a tensor, uh, take the divergence of this, just like in vector calculus, then both sides are divergence-free. And that means that you have four equations out of these 16. And people typically think, so think of the divergence of the right-hand side vanishing as the four equations you need to write down the motion of matter. So these are the four equations that give you fluid dynamics, if you like. Okay? They give you four equations that look like the textbook fluid dynamics that you would see early on as an undergraduate. Okay? 
Now, I want to try to tell you about situations where this, this doesn't work. It's not enough. So you need more than this. We need to think about this in a different way. But before I did that, I thought I should talk a little bit about how does it work then. Okay? So the natural thing to do is to talk about how do things move. Okay? And so the key player in relativity and motion is called the four velocity. Okay? So that's essentially an object that says, how do things move in space and time? But you have to think about this in a way that doesn't depend on coordinates, because the system is, the equations are supposed to be coordinate independent. So the way you can think about this is that you let bodies, like this red little box, move along some curve in space and time. Okay? It's called the world line. Okay? Now, once you know what this curve is, you can always work out the tangent to the curve at any given point. Okay? As in the usual way, when you have a curve, you work out the tangent. That tangent is called the full velocity. Okay? That's all it is. And then you add in one more thing, which is that if this little box carries a tiny little Cartesian coordinate system along with it, right, then as it rides along this curve, then the four velocity only has a time component. So out of these four components, one is time and three is space. And that time component measures something called proper time. So now I have a way, starting with just there are these curves in space and time, of defining along each curve a velocity, okay? and I have a way of measuring time along each of these curves. Okay? And that means that I can think of the fluid as being these, this little box. This could be a fluid element. Okay? And I can populate the whole universe or the whole space I'm interested in by fluid elements. And I have a way of sort of covering all of space, and time, and it's called the vibration because I've got these sort of world tubes or lines, whatever it is, that cover all the space. Okay? And I have local clocks going along each other. What I don't have, I don't have an immediate way of connecting these clocks. Okay? And that will become problematic for me in, in a minute. And basically, um, this is the idea. This is the perfect way, from a, a theorist's point of view, to describe fluids, because I have a way describing how each fluid box moves into its own future. Okay? And that's how we actually tend to think about fluid dynamics. Now, then what people do is they invent this stress-energy tensor, and so typically what they do is they ask the following question, what is the simplest object I can get away with? Let's not ask if it's realistic, or but what can I get away with? And then you have to think about, I actually have to go away and solve these complicated equations for whatever it is. So the simplest model that makes any sense for a fluid is something that's got a pressure P and an energy density rho. Okay? And then it's built out of the space-time metric, the g, little g alpha beta, and that four velocity that you I have an idea how things move, and I have an idea of what the shape of space and time is in terms of the metric, and I build this object. Okay? But I have four equations. I have three components, it turns out, in this four velocity u. I have the p and the rock. There's five quantities, four equations. I can't solve this problem. You need to tell me something more. Okay. So what you need to tell me is something called the equation of state. And the equation of state is something that basically some people just invent. It's a relationship between the pressure and the density. Okay. Uh, it should come from the small scale physics. And so actually building this equation of state is one of the big, big challenges where Relativity and gravity connect with nuclear physics and particle physics. I'm not going to talk about that either. And then you crank out these four equations, the divergence of this T A alpha beta guy, and you find, not surprisingly, that you have three equations that represent momentum conservation that look like the order equations from standard fluid dynamics. They basically say that 
the fluid accelerates because of pressure gradients. That's what fluids do. And then there's one equation that says the energy in terms of this little rho is conserved. Basically, what it says, the second equation says the divergence of this u, so if these flow lines come together or diverge, dictates how much energy I've got in the box. Okay? So basically, if they get more dilute, the de density goes down. It's very intuitive. Okay? Of course, they involve quantities like this tau, which is that proper time along the motion. These are, they have some funny uh, perpendicular operator there, and so on. There's stuff there that you don't really need to know. You just need to understand that it does what you expect it to do. In a slightly different way, but it's the kind of same intuition as usual. So now I've set this up. It's great. And then you want to make contact with reality. So the reality that I would personally like to make contact with uh, links fluid dynamics and gravity. And the thing that links these two is gravitational waves. Okay? Because if we're interested in neutral stars, then gravitational waves is the way to see these objects in a way that we can't do with radio telescopes, for example. So, the famous example, in fact, the only example of this, is the neutral star merger from 2017. And so, basically, being the most spectacular event in the history of astronomy, in the sense that it brought together, you know, 20-30% of the planet's astronomers on the different papers written about this, and they can't, it's difficult to think of it, there's nothing else I've ever done that before. Um, and it did that because there was a the gravitational wave signal up on the left, seen by the LIGO detectors and the Virgo detector, immediately followed by a flash in gamma rays, confirming the idea that colliding neutral stars lead to gamma ray bursts that are seen at very large distances, followed by X-ray emission, UV emission, optical emission, even amateur astronomers could see this thing in a, you know, these little dot next to a galaxy, followed by radio eventually, confirming things like colliding neutral stars make a fairly large fraction of all the gold in the universe. You can see the headlines. It's quite easy. Right? And so, what you'd like to do is model these kinds of things. Now, from what I've said, you might understand this is not a, this is not a toy calculation. And we're not going to go there. But I want to tell you how we have to change our attitude to even make it possible. Okay. And so what we have to do is we have to give up what I talked about, this thing about having clocks on flow lines, and think about how do I tell a computer to do this? Because I can't solve these equations. I need to use computer simulations to do it. So how do I do that? Okay. And I change. To do that, I have to change the attitude. So here's the spirit of what you do. Instead of following this, this flow line, you say, I need to tell the computer to march from one time to another. So whereas Einstein's general relativity has a particular merit of saying space and time live together, you don't separate the two, in order to do this on a computer, I've got to split them up again. Okay? So the way you can do that is to say, well, I'm going to split up space and time by instead of working along these flow lines as I did, I'm going to just do a cut through something. I'm going to call it space. And then I'm going to take the normal to that surface and call that time, essentially. But then you see what happens, these flow lines move relative to this normal, so they now move a little bit, they have their own clocks, right? Well, they move into their own futures, but now in this new setup, they move a little bit in time and a little bit in space. So I'm mixing things up. And that makes the thing with fluids a bit messier, because the fluid dynamics naturally follows these flow lines, whereas now I'm messing up. And that makes the problem a bit complicated. Okay? But it allows me to 
put this problem on the computer and it allows me to do simulations. It allows me to ask what happens if I crash two neutron stars together. It allows me to set up a supercomputer simulation that takes a week to run so I can take a week off before I come back and realize I messed it up so I'm going to start it again. Okay? Um, and it allows me to ask questions like what happens after the two stars collide because I'm doing this in full general relativity I might form black holes. But that means I need to be careful because now I need to be able to track in this simulation if black holes form, and that has its own challenges. And then I need to do this with the kind of precision that allows me to say that the gravitational wave signal that I get out is precise enough that you can go away and match it against observations. So it's quite quite messy. So this is the kind of thing that people are doing. So let me just show you the kind of thing an example of the simulations that we've done. So this is just an example. It doesn't show you anything fancy. It just takes um, two stars going around with other, with each other, around each other. You see the density scale kind of up to 10 to the 15 grams per cent cubic centimeter, which is a lot. And then there's some red wisps of lower density material. Things come together. It's really boring. It's hard to think of anything more boring than this. You know, maybe some uh, something from BBC Parliament would be worse, but you know, but that tends to be more explosive than this at the moment. So I, you know, so you, there's not much happening in a way. The two stars come together; they do maybe form a black hole at the end. You need to keep track of these things. But these, the point I want to make is these simulations are really difficult. It's taken the community decades to get to this point. Okay. And they're expensive in terms of computing. These things are run on the biggest supercomputers people can get their hands on. And they take a long time. So it's a challenge to ask, how do we do this better? Okay? So instead of going into what they are, I just thought I should talk about what they are not. And so we're able to do this. We can take two stars going around one another a couple of times, crashing together forming black holes, read off gravitational waves, ask if there's an electromagnetic signature, see if there's any matter flung out that could form gold, all that stuff. Okay? Maybe we can't do it very well, but at least we can do some of it. Okay? So that's a success. But the problem is, when the stars come together, the matter gets extremely hot. It gets hotter in some of these simulations, then in the supernova collapse when the star is born. So that's extremely hot. Um, we're interested in what happens to electromagnetism and magnetic fields, because we think that the stars have magnetic fields, and when this guy, these two come together, they will somehow collimate and lead to this gamma ray outflow. That's what we think. We can't simulate that. But we think it's true. And we have observations that suggest that it's true. We'd like to track Neutrinos, but neutrinos are pesky little characters that involves a phase space that is multidimensional, which makes the simulation so expensive that we can't do it. And so these things are done, but typically not together, not in the same simulation. So I would do one thing, my colleague over here would do another thing, and then we just go around the world complaining that we don't do the right thing. Um, and that's where we are. So it's good enough, I think, for getting an idea of what gravitational wave signals are and so on. But there is a worry that if we keep on have detecting gravitational waves, maybe our simulations are not good enough in terms of the physics to allow us to say, this is now what we're learning about physics. And that's what we'd like to do. We'd like to use the observations to learn about physics. That's the, you know, almost the whole motivation, okay? Other than to say, look, guys, we did this. And get a Nobel Prize or two. That's, you know, but... So, so my thinking, and this is why you know, it motivates everything I do in this area, is that this is the target. 
and we're not there. But if we want to do the physics better, we might have to rethink the strategy again. And that's what I want to tell you about. Okay. So, I'm going to take these equations and rewrite them. So there's going to be some equations again. Remember, I talked about this energy conservation. Because they look like, like that. It's basically time derivative of an energy density is some divergence of fluid. Now, I can go back and think about these Gibbs relations in the thermodynamics, and I can quite easily prove that this is just a statement of the number of particles per unit volume in this box are conserved. And that's actually the physics. Because in physics, in relativistic physics, the object that's conserved is baryon number. And so I don't really care about this energy density, whatever it is. It's the baryon number that sits in there that's conserved. And that's stated in this very simple little equation as the divergence of this flux is zero. So by understanding the small scale of physics a bit better, I can understand what the fluid dynamics is doing, it's doing the right thing. But this fact that this have this conservation allows me to rethink what the fluid equations should be. Because I can now do something um, that basically looks like the order of Lagrange equations from mechanics. I can do a variational calculation of what the fluid dynamics should be. I don't want to bore you with that, it's not trivial. But the idea is that instead of thinking about these flow lines, now I've done them red to make them fancy, I think of the three the four dimensions of the flow lines, but the three dimensions are essentially the dimensions of each of these little boxes. And then I have equations of those little boxes that are then mapped back to space and time. Okay? And the equations that come out look quite different from what you're used to. And I've got them in this red box here, they don't mean anything really, apart from what they are, is a statement about the vorticity of the flow. And if you know anything about normal fluid dynamics, you know that people don't like to talk about vorticity equations because they're messy. But here, the vorticity comes to the fore as the main player. And so trying to understand that is, is interesting. So this is a lot of work unfortunately, and quite a lot of thinking about geometry and mathematics. So it seems like I'm just wasting time, but you know, I'm an academic, so maybe I'm allowed to do that. I can get away with sitting in my office there recording this, so that posterity will know that I'm wasting time, taxpayers' money, that sort of thing. Um, but this new approach has done something that I couldn't do before. What it's done is given me a strategy for getting the equations I would need if I have more than one flow. From the Einstein equations, I have that divergence of the T thing. There's only ever four equations. Okay? In fluid dynamics, I need a pressure, three velocity components, an equation of state to give me a this five. But I can tell you straight off three situations that are really interesting to me, but I need more. Where there is matter flow and heat flow relative to it. The matter flow is already takes up these equations. What does the heat flow do? I don't have equations for this. Another one is electromagnetism. In electromagnetism, you have matter flow, but you have charged currents. What do the charged currents do? Then we have cold physics, low temperature physics, where you have superfluids. Superfluids are distinguished by having additional flows. You have matter flow and some counter flow. How do I describe this counter flow? Where do the equations come from? How do you do this in relativity? And so that's the kind of thing that we're now able to answer. And the way we do it is you just take this picture and say, well, you know, if I've got the red flow lines, mapping into some space, and I work out some equations, I can have blue flow lines that go some other way, mapping into some other space, and giving me some, some other equations. And so, this is absolutely trivial to generalize, well, trivial, I shouldn't say that, maybe, but 
it's straightforward to generalize to any number of fluid flows you like. Okay? And so I can write down the equations for these much more complicated systems. They look exactly the same. I just take the ones I had before, I put a little X on them to say this one is blue, this one is red. Okay? So I'm making this sound a little bit easier than this, right? But that really is the essence. And that means I'm now ready to do things I couldn't do before. I can do relativistic superfluids. And in fact, the relativistic superfluids have something really neat and easy about them because this equation at the bottom is a vorticity equation. Superfluids, in their purest state, are irrotational. That means they have no vorticity. That means that thing is zero by definition. The equations say it should be zero, it's zero by definition. And it does become zero simply by saying that this new character, which is a momentum, is the gradient of a scalar potential. And the object I've written there is anti-symmetric, so that part will have to vanish. So that comes out straight away. Now, unfortunately, in reality, uh, superfluids do rotate, and they do so by forming thin, slim tornadoes called vortices. Uh, and so the only thing I've done is I've created a problem for myself where I need to work out what happens if I've got a tangle of these vortex tubes. Um, so let me get back to the fluid element size. I said I average over some scattering length scale. Could be in a neutral star, millimeters, centimeters, that sort of thing. The vortices have a width of about 100 Fermi. So they live on a scale that are much, much smaller than this. And I've got something like, in a neutral star that rotates like the objects we see, I've got something like a million, million vortices to keep track of. So now I need to do some other averaging over the vorticity. And that's an example of how these problems can get absolutely atrocious. But it's interesting to try to understand because we see, um, we think, a manifestations of how superfluidity impacts on the spin of neutral stars through something called glitches. Basically, neutral stars typically spin down regularly, but every now and then, especially young systems, start suddenly just spinning up for a little time and then relaxing. So here is uh, my favorite example, because I'm work on it, is that uh, a young X-ray pulsar called 0537-6910. And you can see this is the spin down rate with time over some dozen years or something. This is not, I should just point out to you, this is not a straight line. This is jittery up and down kind of line where these, every single step here is one of these spin glitches. And what we think is going on is that the superfluid vortices, every now and then, decide to move up, which changes, which will change the spin rate of the star. Okay. And they do so in this sort of jittery fashion. So in order to understand how it goes, we need to be able to model these things with some fluid model, because there's no way of keeping track of a hundred, of a million, million entities. It's not, it's not practical. So there's one reason why this is interesting. The other one, which I think is... Um, Conceptually, uh, quite important, but well, it is conceptually quite important, is heat. So heat is a starting point for thinking about viscosity and dissipation and complicated stuff. But already at the point of thinking about heat, in relativity, you will have a massive problem that people don't like to talk about. Because either they don't understand that there's a problem, or they think it's been solved. And so, Neither of those are true. So what is the problem? Well, you've probably seen in your lives the heat equation is a diffusion equation. Okay? Now, the problem with diffusion equations is that if you ask how fast do heat signals propagate, if I change the heat a bit over here, how soon do I know over there that I did it? And the answer is, you know immediately. Now, that's not allowed in general relativity because general, special relativity has a speed limit. 
you cannot send signals faster than the speed of light. So this is a, a non-causal theory, and that's not going to happen. Um, so you try to fix this, and it's important to do that because you know neutron stars are hot, so we need to worry about them when, at least when they're young and or merge. And as I said, the quark blue and plasma and colliders is also hot. So worrying about heat and temperature, temperature and entropy and so on is important. But if the heat equation has got conceptual issues, then that's also problematic. And so it's even worse than that. Because um, you can show that a straightforward generalization of the heat equation to general relativity is violently unstable. It gives you a theory that predicts that water at room temperature should explode. That doesn't happen. So it's a rubbish theory. Okay? And so that's a well-known problem which has been understood, and we'll show you one of the ways that you can explain it, but I would not hesitate to say that there's a lot more work to be done on this. So the key point here is entropy. I'm sure you know that entropy is a vexing object that has many different manifestations. It's uh, you know representing disorder in a system, maybe information, other things. But it is a key player in thermodynamics because it has to set, satisfy the second law, which says it cannot decrease. So here's a way you can think about heat flow, which is you got matter and you got entropy. Think of the entropy as a fluid. Now this is highly illegal because it echoes something called the caloric theory, which goes back a long time, which was ruled out because it was crazy. So I'm going to do that anyway, because, you know, what have I got to lose? So I'm going to treat the entropy as a fluid. And then I'm going to use this model that we wrote down. So I have a conserved particle flux. I've got the entropy. It's not conserved. It has to satisfy the second law. So I've made sure that it does that. I've got a gamma s that says how much does the entropy increase. And then out of these equations I wrote down, I get an equation for the heat flux, which I call little q. Okay? So I've got to point to some of these bits. I'm not expecting you to remember any of the details, but this guy is the heat flux. From the standard theory for heat, you know that the heat flux, heat flows away from hotter regions. So it should be proportional to temperature gradients. This is a temperature gradient. There's a minus sign here that says heat does flow away from hotter regions. It does what it says on the box. This is the heat equation, the normal heat equation. Okay? But there's more. There's a coupling here to the acceleration of the fluid. Some people don't like that term, so they just remove it. If you remove that term, that's what gives you these explosions. Okay? So that has to be there. So this is a, a good term to have. Then it has another piece over here, which has the time derivative of this heat flux in it, with some coefficient. That term is immensely important. That term says there is a finite propagation speed to heat. That's the one that fixes the causality problem. And the number in front that I called little tau is a measure that comes from the theory, I don't know what number it is because I don't have a smaller scale theory, but it's a number that says how easy is it for the heat to flow through matter. It measures essentially how much does the heat weigh. And now you have to think, that sounds a bit crazy, heat having weight, but heat carries energy in relativity, energy is mass, so it's not a crazy idea at all. Okay. It's totally natural. And so what comes out of it is a prediction, if you like, that if you're in a certain regime, you will have two kinds of sound. One sound are the usual sort of pressure waves, and one sound which is due to heat waves. 
Okay, now you say that the lift man is just nuts, let's get rid of him uh, and uh, tell him to go home. But these second sound waves have been observed in crystals. So a, heat, a proper theory should do this. And the theory does do that. So here's an example of a system that has problems in the usual description. And we're now beginning to make progress on understanding how it should go. Okay, so I'm going to finish. And I thought I would finish with the gravity side of things, because I was kind of avoiding that a little bit, and the field theory side of it. And so here's another way I could have done this. I could have started talking about gravity and black holes. Okay? So you could ask questions like, what about gravity? Is gravity a thermodynamical system? Can I think about entropy of gravity? Well, this is Cambridge. You should know that you can do this. That you can think of black holes as having thermodynamical laws where the area of the black hole tells you what temperature it has. Right? But this doesn't seem at first to have much to do with fluid dynamics. It's got to do with thermodynamics. But what has it got to do with fluid dynamics? Well, it's a funny thing. I think, that historically, when it comes to black holes, the thing that people didn't like for a long, long time was the fact that it appears, if you throw things into a black hole, it appears to you over there as if they never really reach the horizon, never really fall through, they collect and gather up at the horizon, they never go through. So we know that that's not true, we know that if you fall along with these objects, you fall in and then never come back, we know that. But, what you can do, which is interesting, you can think about this stuff that sort of appears to gather outside the horizon as a thin kind of membrane that has physical properties. And those physical properties, remarkably, are described by something that looks like the laws of fluid dynamics. Coincidence? I don't know. But this has led to um, a very powerful idea it's called holography. It comes out of string theory. And the idea is simply that you look at this kind of membrane near a horizon, which has got one dimension lower than the space-time. Okay? It's a three-dimensional thing, because it's on the surface in four dimensions. And then you compare that theory to what the bigger theory does, and then you come up with essentially a dictionary that says there is some fluid dynamics in the lower dimension that relates to some more general physics in the high dimension. It's called the ABS CFT conjecture or correspondence. Um, so what people are working hard on now is trying to develop this dictionary and the idea is this, that some calculations are easier to do for black holes than say in QCD or something like that. So strongly coupled field theories, hard to calculate, whereas gravity is Supposedly easy. Now I'm working more on the gravity side, I find that quite hard, but you know, that could just be me. But the idea is quite interesting that you can, by this correspondence, go from a system that is really hard to work with to a system that you might understand better. Right? And so this is now being applied to all sorts of things. For example, one of the problems I talked about in the beginning the quark blue on plasma that's formed in particle collisions. Okay. So the theory from this field theory approach and the combination of relativity in black holes and so on predicts a bound on the viscosities in these things, which is not exactly what was, has been observed in heavy iron collisions, but is not far from it. So this seems completely outlandish when you think about it, but there could be something to it.
And so the bottom line is, there is a deep connection between fluid dynamics, relativity, black holes, and thermodynamics. And if, as a physicist, that doesn't make you excited, honestly, I don't know if there's anything that could. So that's me. I'm done. Uh, it was a random ramble, maybe. I tried to put together a particular journey through this really messy landscape of physics. I wanted to give you an impression rather than a sort of detailed working knowledge. I wouldn't have been able to do that anyway. There are many other paths through this same landscape. Take, you have to start from the beginning and go backwards or whatever. Many different ways of doing this. The key point is fluid dynamics. I think when you're taught fluid dynamics, even at university, you're taught fluid dynamics as a, you know, this is hundreds of years old, really rather boring, you know. But fluid dynamics really is anything but boring. It's where all of physics meet. And that means it's a fun place to be. Thank you.